Hello everyone, good evening and welcome to our fifth lecture for our radiology series. My name is Hiranyada and I'm a fourth year medical student at LF1 and also an education officer at EYMS. I welcome to all of you to our fifth lecture in collaboration with the Medical University of Plevin Emergency Medicine Society. Today our speaker is Dr. Hamza Khan. I warmly welcome him and all of you to our lecture. If you guys have any questions, please post in the chat and over to Dr. Hamza. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Hamza uh, and I'm going to be presenting uh, a presentation on uh, CT scans today. So thank you for those of you who are joining us um, and uh, thank you very much for that warm introduction. That was fantastic. Just uh, for those of you who are here, can you see the screen? I uh, just wanted a thumbs up uh, maybe in the comment section just to see if you guys can see the screen. Perfect. Excellent. Great. Okay, cool. So we can see the screen. Excellent. So um, we can start. Right, so uh, firstly, special thanks to UIMS uh, in Czech Republic. Thank you very much for hosting us, uh, me and my colleagues from uh, the UK. Uh, I actually graduated from the Czech Republic in 2020. I studied at uh, Palatsky University in Olomouc. Uh, so Czech's very familiar to me. I'd also like to thank uh, Pleven uh, University's Med Emergency Medicine Society and uh, my colleagues from Croydon Hospital, which is where I work and where they work as well. That's Dr. Tiju Zakaria and Dr. Karthik Rajagopal. And finally, uh, Dr. Paramis Paran, who's a consultant radiologist at Croydon University Hospital. So <clears throat> today's main uh, objective essentially is to learn how to apply the basic principles of CT imaging. A um, little disclaimer, we're not clinical radiologists, uh, we're not uh, diagnostic radiologists, so uh, we're going to teach you, well, I'm going to teach you as best as I can, and we'll teach you as best as we can throughout this series. Um, any issues with audio, by the way, please let me know, I can try and sort out as soon as possible. And uh, what I would also like to say is the whole point of this lecture is to give you some basic principles and teaching so that you can, when you look at CT scans, you can try and apply them. You're not going to be experts by the end of this lecture, but at least you'll know something. So as the introduction, there are three things that we're gonna be focusing on. The first is recapping the basic principles of uh, interpreting CT scans. And I think the basic principle is the main thing that we want you to take away from this series when it comes to CTs. Um, CT scans are very complex. Uh, depending on the patient, their uh, complex medical history and comorbidity as well. And uh, essentially, uh, because of that, um, interpreting them can be quite uh, difficult. So that's exactly why, as long as you know the basic principles, you can try and figure out or piece together a couple of uh, pieces or parts of the puzzle. Uh, we were going to focus on the CT thorax as well as the CT abdo pelvis in today's lecture, but I don't want to overwhelm you guys, so I think we'll just focus on the CT abdo pelvis today uh, with the aim of discussing CT thorax in the next upcoming lecture. We're going to be talking about the clinical indications for uh, the CT abdo pelvis, and there will be some clinical cases as well as we go through. They're not too hard clinical cases. Um, but once again, uh, we'll, they will be used to practice what we've learned. So let's recap the basic principles. Um, there are essentially uh, three uh, basic principles that we're going to be focusing on. Um, and there'll be a couple of other ones that uh, we, can, uh, we can talk about afterwards. But the main three principles that I want to focus on are Hounsfield units and using Hounsfield units, uh, the concept of windowing, and finally contrast and what contrast is and how contrast works. Uh, 
so before we move on, does anybody know uh, what Hounsfield units are? For those of you people who are here, any any particular idea of what they are and what they what they have a look at? Okay. So we can move on to the next bit where we talk about the Hounsfield units. So uh, essentially, when a person goes through a CT scan, the CT scanner directs a number of X-rays to um, to the patient, uh, and it it happens in a three hundred and sixty degree uh, motion essentially. Uh, what happens is when the X-rays uh, essentially uh, when the patient is exposed to those X-rays, they calculate what the patient would look like uh, using something called Voxel. Now, Voxel is basically a small unit as such. Um, and they're a bit like pixels. So if you put those pixels together, you then form the whole image. Um, how do you differentiate between the different Voxels? How do you differentiate between different types of tissue? Uh, you've got water, you've got soft tissue, muscle mass, uh, you've got arteries, you've got veins, you've got bone. And how do you differentiate between all those two, all those different things? Because all of them will be represented by these voxels. And essentially what we use it on CT scans anyway, is something called Hounsfield units. There are, everything is presented in different shades of gray, all right? Um, and here we can see a small diagram, which is just to represent, don't worry about the numbers at the moment. The numbers are not so important at the moment. It's just the concept of what they represent. Um, and essentially, we can see in this particular diagram that um, uh, there are certain types of tissue which are very hard, and so will be higher on the scale of the Hounsfield units. In, in other words, bone is plus 1,000. And then there are literally non-existent areas where there's air, essentially, and that's minus 1,000. And somewhere in the middle, we've got soft tissue. So you've got fat, water, and muscle. Now, some people think that fat is actually more dense than water. Water is meant to be zero. But actually, if you think about your science lessons back in school, if you mix water and fat, you find that they're actually immiscible, which means that the water actually sinks beneath the fat. So the fat is actually lighter than water. So in that particular case, the fat and water will present differently on a CT scan, and water would probably represent something a bit lighter on a CT scan. And more importantly, not just water, but when we're looking at something a bit thicker like blood, blood will present a little bit more lighter in comparison to fat or, uh, for example, air. Uh, it's good to get used to the terminology. So we, in CT scans, we look at uh, densities or essentially attenuations. And they're both the same thing, really. Uh, so the higher the density, the whiter it appears on a CT scan. And the lower the density, the darker it appears on a CT scan. So we refer to that as hyperdense and hypodense. All right. Uh, Later on, we'll talk about playing around with these Hounsfield units in order to differentiate between very, very, very similar shades of gray that we see in a CT scan. So I'm talking about, for example, uh, if you're looking at a tissue and you're not too sure if there is some water, edema or swelling, you can change the settings of the CT scan in a particular way or the actual scan itself, not the scanner, but the actual scan in order to create some contrast between those layers of gray so that you can see the difference between those layers of gray more easily. In other words, you're creating a greater difference that you wouldn't be able to see with a naked eye. But we'll talk about that in a minute. So the concept of windowing uh, is basically uh, where we're coming on to what we just discussed about three seconds ago. Now, the concept of uh, windowing essentially is focusing on a particular set of tissues um, in order to <clears throat> differentiate between the different types of tissues. Windowing also allows something called the region of interest, which again is what we discussed, uh, differentiating between different shades of gray. 
So you're focusing on a particular area. And you can see there are different types of windowing in each particular case or each particular type of tissue. The key point here essentially is two terms, width and level. And what do they mean? So I'm going to go back to the image that we just showed and take, for example, uh, brain as an example. So the width is 70, the level is 30. If we go back to this, the, the width is uh, 17, the level is 30. So the, the level is the specific point in uh, the range that essentially we're looking at. OK, so plus 30 is around here somewhere. So we're looking at some soft tissue. But the, the 70, which is the width, is how far apart we are looking in terms of tissues that might represent um, what we're looking at. So in this particular case, it, it will be uh, 45 either way. And that will give you a width of, uh, sorry, 35 either way. That would give you a width of 70. Um, and that's important because what happens is that in brain tissue, say, for example, you're looking at a patient who may have had a stroke, okay, uh, you can differentiate between what might be edema and what might be brain parenchyma. Uh, and so, you, you know, differentiating between subtle uh, differences there can help you achieve an accurate diagnosis. But as I said, the, the numbers aren't so important at this stage. I think the key understanding or key concept is um understanding that you can essentially play around with the ct in order to look or differentiate between different shades of gray let's uh move on to the idea of contrast so contrast in, in a ct is usually iodine based in an mri mri it's usually gadolinium based and the contrast essentially enhances particular structures all right um any questions by the way please feel free to pop it into the uh, comment section and we'll, we'll answer them as we go along. So the uh, in terms of contrast, what happens is, is the contrast will go through different stages. And those different stages will allow us to visualize uh, different structures. So the first stage is the arterial stage. And this is usually the first 20 to 40 seconds of the contrast being uh, administered and so it goes through the arteries essentially the second is the venous or the port venous stage this is about 60 to 80 seconds into administering the contrast and finally the third is what we refer to as the delayed phase which is about five to ten minutes after administering the contrast why are all these three things important and how are they used so if you want to look at arteries the best phase to look at it is the arterial phase. Um, and you can see an example of the pulmonary arteries, which we'll be discussing more in the next lecture in our CT chest and CTPA, uh, but, uh, and also systemic arteries as well, which come a little bit later. And that makes sense, okay, because it's going to go through your pulmonary vessels first, and then your heart, and it's pumped out out of your heart or the left ventricle to the rest of your organs. So it goes into your systemic circulation. And then if you want to have a look at things like the liver, for example, uh, then the best uh, thing to look at or the best point to look at after, after administering contrast would be the portal venous phase. That will enhance things like the portal vein, the hepatic vein, for example, um, and uh, any pathologies specific to the liver. Um, and finally, the delayed phase. Uh, so an example of the use of delayed phase is in the kidneys. If you're looking at, for example, the collecting system, and more specifically, you're looking at the ureters and the urinary pelvis uh, or the, the pelvis of the kidney. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about kidneys later on, so I'm not going to go into too much detail just yet. But that's essentially the idea of contrast. Uh, so the key thing is the three different phases and also um, it's usually iodine based. Great. Um, another concept to understand is planes. So again, you know, there's your sagittal, your coronal, um, and uh, your transverse as well, or axial or plane. Uh, once again, this isn't so important just yet, because you'll be seeing most of the time your CT scans are done in 
you know, you'll, you'll see the meninaxial planes, so as if the body's been cut into half, but you could also see it in coronal uh, planes as well, for example. So um, the CT, that when, you, when you get a scan, it will allow you to flick between different uh, planes in order to understand uh, what you're looking at, really. Um, and when you, it's important to know that when you're looking at a CT scan, it's as if the, pe the patient's feet are facing towards you and their head is facing away. So that's a concept that sometimes throws people off. Um, you have to imagine that the feet are facing towards you and the head is facing away from the patient. So you are standing at one end of their CT scanner or one end of their bed uh, with their feet facing towards you. Okay. And that's how the CT scan is basically looked at. When you scroll up and down a CT scan, that's how we how we imagine things, or that's how we essentially look at things. And that also means that your left is their right and their left is your right. Yeah. You know? So it's it, it becomes the opposite essentially. And that's important when you're looking at it because otherwise you'll end up making mistakes and saying, oh, well, that's left or right. And actually, yeah. So um, we're going to talk about uh, the indications or a little bit about indications. Do you really need a CT? Uh, because a lot of research shows that actually maybe we are over scanning. Okay. Maybe we are um, uh, doing too many X CTs um, and, and X rays and other scans as well. Why is that a problem? The problem is that we expose uh, patients to a lot of radiation when we do uh, CT scans. And there are some patients who have certain diseases or disorders, or comorbidities, which require interval CT scans. For example, patients who have ITP um, or uh, bleeding disorders may need to have interval CT scans if, for example, they, you know, and and more importantly, if they present with certain symptoms, like, for example, headaches, you know, you're thinking to yourself, is there a potential bleed? Or, for example, patients who are on blood thinning medications um, and have had a particular fall, you know, they would need most likely a CT scan of the head. Um, if they're having any kind of, if you're considering any kind of internal bleeding, they would need a CT scan. So the indications for a CT scan really depend on a couple of things. It depends on your clinical judgment, and it also depends on clinical guidelines. Um, towards the um, the the right, uh, I've included uh, our nice guidelines for our CT head. Okay, so essentially we have a look at this when uh, we are considering doing a CT head scan on adults, and you can see there are a couple of things that we look at. We look at the GCS. We look at the number of times they vomited. Any acute neurology. Uh, so, but it varies from physician to physician. Some people are a little bit more lenient on ordering the scans. Others are very strict in following the guidelines. And technically, you should be following the guidelines. Okay. Uh, I work in the emergency department, and so does Dr. Tiju and Dr. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Karthik. And uh, we, uh, we, we have this debate every now and then as to whether the patient really needs a scan or not. But uh, sometimes it's safer to do it if, for example, they're elderly and, as I said, they're on blood thinning medication. You don't want to miss a potential bleed in the head. Okay, so uh, this is just to practice uh, what we basically learned so far. I know you guys probably know what it's showing, which is great. Uh, but I'm going to point to a couple of structures, and if you guys can, that'd be great. If not, I'll talk through it. Um, I I want to try and practice the terms that we've just used. So uh, this is obviously what is this? Uh, what are we looking at here? Would that be soft tissue? What what, what would that be? So this is essentially bone. This is your lumbar sacral spine. This is your pelvis. Um, and the reason why it's completely white is because this is a high attenuation or hyperdense, essentially, but high attenuation. Um, and in terms of Howland's fields, we said bone was right at the end, which is about uh, plus thousand. Um, then we've got some soft tissue here. Most soft tissue will lie anywhere between minus 100 to plus 100. 
you have air here in the colon, that's going to be at the other end of the spectrum. And finally, we look at things like kidneys, for example. So this in particular, um, you know, if we're looking at a contrast scan, it, this is probably towards the late arterial phase of some kind, I think. Um, we'll talk about the kidneys a bit later on and how the different phases affect what you see in the kidney. And again, in terms of detecting abnormalities, so you can see here, for example, this is the brain tissue or brain parenchyma, and surrounding this is basically the skull. And it, there's obviously an abnormal mass there. And this is how the abnormal mass presents. So sometimes abnormalities can be more subtle than this, but this is just an example. And it's a very easy example, but something to illustrate the point that you have a slightly lighter shade of gray in the middle and surrounding it, you've got a darker shade of gray, and then everything else looks pretty normal around here. So this slightly, the circumcised, slightly lighter shade of gray is most likely a mass of some sort. Um, and it looks, you know, it's got an irregular border. Uh, and around it is some hypo attenuation in comparison to the mass. That hypoattenuation represents a bit of swelling or edema, essentially. Um, if it grows even darker, could it might even represent some blood. But re really, I think at this point, it just represents some edema. So you know that there's something wrong here, and this is essentially a brain tumor. All right, so we're going to move on to uh, the CT tablet health. I'm going to talk about that. Any questions so far? Anyone have any questions so far? No, great, fantastic. So um, let's move on. So key indications for acute abdominal pain. We've got a couple of key uh, reasons why we do a CT abdo pelvis. The first are gastrointestinal causes. So uh, we've got your cholecystitis, your obstruction, appendicitis, perforation, types of infection, like for example, intra-abdominal sepsis, abscesses, um, you want to know, for example, how big the abscess is so that you can eventually drain it. Uh, other causes include vascular causes. So uh, AAA, for example. And in AAA, we know that it's usually um, aneurysms and ruptures occur more commonly in males, particularly middle-aged males. Um, and there's a particular pattern of surveillance for it as well. So if it's less than five centimeters, then it's usually a... Um, a uh, six monthly to yearly surveillance. If it's more than five centimeters, then it's a little bit more common. It's about three months. And if it's more than 5.5 .5 centimeters in particular, uh, then you should scan them really. They're presenting with symptoms. Um, other indications include trauma. So uh, if, for example, you're considering a potential bleed in the abdomen, so someone's come in a little bit hypertensive, he's had, you know, an RTC or a road traffic accident of some sort, and he's having acute abdominal pain, you should really scan them to understand what's going on in the abdomen. Do they have a liver laceration? Uh, have it has there been a perforation of some kind? Has there been some blunt trauma that you're not, you know, uh, that you can't really see? Um, and finally, we've got gynecological causes of acute abdominal pain, uh, ovarian torsion, um, pain from cysts, for example, or mid-cycle pain. Uh, these are particular causes of acute abdominal pain. So I actually once had a <clears throat> patient myself who I thought had an appendicitis, a female patient. Um, she was in her 40s, uh, late 40s, actually. Um, and I think she was basically perimenopausal at the, at the time, of course. Uh, she presented with right lower quadrant pain, guarding abdomen. And I thought, you know, the first, what, what, what would kill her? quickly uh would it be an appendix or would it be an ovarian torsion to be honest both of them are very are very dangerous things so i i uh of course before you scan you should do a pregnancy test to make sure that they're not pregnant but to be honest you have to weigh up what you're looking at in a clinical scenario and a lot of uh you know radiographers they ask for pregnancy tests and things like that which is great so um but you've got to think about you know 
what's going to happen to the patient is and what's the best for the patient we should probably scan her so i sent her for a scan see she was not pregnant at the time um and uh when the scan came out the the appendix was completely fine but it was actually mid-cycle pain that she was having um and the radiologist could see uh, from the stage of uh of, of a cycle that she was in so um it, essentially uh there's lots of different causes of acute abdominal pain and it's never a wrong decision to scan someone if you think that they have a life-threatening condition okay going back to what we were talking about in terms of indications cool so we're going to go for some basic anatomy um now this is a lot of a lot of information here so if you need to butt me in at some point please do I'm more than happy let's talk about some basic anatomy so there are two major areas of the abdomen, the peritoneal area or um, the peritoneal space, and you have a space behind it, namely the retroperitoneum. So essentially, the uh, in the peritoneum, we've got the stomach, the spleen, uh, the first and fourth parts of the duodenum, the jejunum and ileum, so the rest of the small intestine, and you've got the transverse and sigmoid. In the retroperitoneum, so behind the peritoneum, uh, you've got the kidneys, the adrenal, uh, you've got the pancreas, uh, ascending, descending colon, and also the second and third parts of the duodenum. Now, what is the peritoneum? It's essentially a sheet of connective tissue, and there's two parts to it. You've got your parietal and your visceral, okay? So the visceral basically line the internal organs. Um, in this particular case, you can see that this is all the visceral uh, peritoneums lining particular organs. That's the liver, stomach, um, so uh, this is the uh, uh, parietal uh, peritoneum, and the parietal peritoneum lines the um, lining of the abdominal wall, and the space between it is what we call the peritoneal cavity. So uh, there's particular areas uh, of this that we can essentially scan if we are thinking of things like free fluid or blood, and come on to that in just a minute. We also have uh, peritoneal, excuse me, <clears throat> peritoneal ligaments, which are essentially extensions of the peritoneum, uh, and they connect to different organs. So you've got the omentum and the mesentery. Okay, uh, and clinically, that's important because when you're looking at a scan, uh, you there may be things that you want to comment on with those particular ligaments. Right. So um, in terms of the basic vasculature i think the key things to understand is uh basically that if i was to take a couple of things away your main bifurcation happens at l5 your mesenteric arteries which supply the intestines come off at l1 and l3 so superior mesenteric inferior mesenteric um and uh the uh uh renal arteries come off the superior mesenteric artery so talk about when we you talk about kidneys, we'll learn more about that in a minute. And uh, that's that. So just a couple of bits of information about important spaces, as we talked about. So uh, we have a space by the name of Morrison's pouch. It's also called the hepatorenal space. And that's important. You can actually see this on what's called a fast scan, um, which is an, an ultrasound scan, essentially. Um, and it's a focus assessment on that particular area. And what you're looking for is free fluid in that particular area. And if there is free fluid, um, then that's dangerous for the patient. That could mean uh, blood essentially in, in that particular cavity, okay? Uh, and as I said, it's between the liver, hepatorenal, so liver and the kidney. Uh, there's also in the pelvis, uh, there's also the rectouterine pouch in females, uh, also called the pouch of Douglas. And in, in males, it's of course in the uterus, so it would be the rectovesical pouch between the rectum and the bladder. Okay, so you've got your bladder, uh, and then in between the bladder and the rectum, you usually have the vagina in females, and superiorly, you've got the uh, the uterus. And in males, of course, it's just the bladder and the rectum. Okay, so those are those. That's the basic anatomy of the pelvis. Uh, and in, in the pelvis, the, the terms are opposite. So you usually go from anterior to posterior, but in the pelvis, you go the opposite way. It's posterior to anterior. 
other spaces. Um, so, I mean, this is uh, a little bit less, um, how do we say it, uh, important as such, but it's good to know. So, um, uh, less important your state. I mean, if you want to become a radiologist, it's all important stuff. So, uh, but yeah, um, essentially, you've got the subphrenic spaces, which is under the diaphragm. You've got the right and the left. Uh, so, uh, in the right subphrenic space, um, you know, you've got the liver and you've got the um, the gallbladder. In the left subphrenic space, you've got the spleen and the perispenic space. Um, and at the bottom, you've got the paracolic gutters, and they are essentially the left and right uh, lower quadrants. Now, the paracolic gutters uh, include different things. So your right uh, paracolic gutter will include your right colon or your ascending colon. So remember the, the intestines, as you can see in this particular image, it'll go from cecum appendix, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid, rectum, and then into the anus, essentially. So you've got the right paracolic gutter, left paracolic gutter. Um, and as I said, these are important spaces. And then around the kidney, you've got the perirenal uh, space. Um, <clears throat> so that's important. Uh, you've got the anterior pararenal space and posterior pararenal space. The pararenal is basically essentially close to the kidneys, peris surrounding the kidneys. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, the perirenal space is covered by the perirenal fascia, which can be split up into the anterior and posterior. Okay. Um, so in the anterior, uh, you, it's close to the pancreas, as we can see here, essentially, and uh, the posterior perirenal space mainly contains fat. So now we're going to look at um, uh, the CT abdomen pelvis organ by organ. We're going to start off with the liver. So this is the liver, essentially, right here, okay, in both these particular cases. All right. Now, the liver can be split up into eight segments uh, radiologically or radiographically, if you want to call it that. Uh, and it's split up by an important structure. Does anybody know what might be used to split up the liver into its different segments? So uh, the structure that we use is the hepatic vein, okay? So the hepatic vein essentially drains into the vena vena cava and it drains the liver. Um, the, don't confuse that for the portal vein, which drains the superior mesenteric vein and the splenic vein. So the hepatic vein is what we use to uh, drain the, um, the, uh, the, the actual liver itself and splits the liver into eight different segments. Um, these are some of the branches. So we've got the uh, uh, the, the middle, um, the left, and then the right. Okay, so that's the hepatic vein. That's what the liver looks like on uh, the CT. And you can see that obviously blood flowing will be a bit more high attenuation than the soft tissue. This is the stomach as well as contrast. This is the spleen here. That's the spleen there. These are your kidneys. And here you can see a little bit of the pancreas actually, which hugs the splenic vein. So as I said, liver split into eight different segments. Um, now, <clears throat> in terms of the segments, uh, the functional left lobe is segments one to four, and then segments six to eight are the functional uh, right lobe. Six is a little bit more posterior uh, compared to the other lobes, essentially. But this, these are the branches of the hepatic vein. That splits it up. And underneath, you have the gallbladder. Um, the portal vein, which comes off at about the second lumbar vertebrae, rough, roughly around that level, uh, splits into the right and left. And this is the hepatic portal vein here. So when you give a patient contrast, remember that the stage of contrast reading is important. So if you want to look at the portal vein, then you wait until the port of venous which is about 60 to 80 seconds into administering the contrast. So just to recap of the blood supply, you've got the arterial blood supply, which is the right and left hepatic arteries. Uh, you've got the portal vein that drains the superior mesenteric and splenic vein, which is roughly here. That's the splenic vein. That's the pancreas. That's the body and the tail of the pancreas. 
Um, <clears throat> and then you have the hepatic veins. So we've got a small case here. Um, I know it's, it, it looks a bit, uh, it's pretty obvious, but we can, we can go through uh, what we see essentially is the main thing. So you've got an 80 year old man, uh, he's an Asian man, he has a history of alcoholism, um, and you know, he's had occasional pain, abdominal distension for about a year or so. He doesn't understand why he keeps getting uh, his belly becoming bigger, basically. He's having some weight loss as well around the body. Um, and the last two weeks, he's developed jaundice. Uh, on a blood test, uh, you get a little bit suspicious and you order some specific blood tests and you order alpha beta protein. Um, and you do the serum, the, the regular blood test that you do, and you realize his liver function tests are significantly raised. What are we thinking this patient might have? Liver cirrhosis. Okay. So that's a good shout because he has a history carcinoma. All right. Very good. Any other guesses? So we're, on, we're along the right lines already, which is great. Hepatomegaly can be seen. Great. These are all fantastic answers. Yep. So history of alcoholism, of course, you'll have some degree of cirrhosis. And cirrhosis presents with in, in, in different ways, basically. But mainly, you see a lot of scarring and cirrhosis. In this particular case, you can see that the tissue here is quite different to the tissue around here. It's a different attenuation. It's actually a lower attenuation. It's more hypodense or hypoattenuated compared to all the tissues surrounding it. So you know there's something different. And the liver looks a bit enlarged as well, correct? So um, the correct answer is actually hepatocellular carcinoma, absolutely. Uh, so I think it's Anjali said carcinoma, that's, that, that's correct. Uh, you can see the hepatic veins here, by the way. Um, so yeah, that's 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 the correct answer. Now, hepatocellular carcinoma, there are lots of causes for it. It could be virally induced through uh, hepatitis, for example, alcoholism. Uh, most commonly, it's found in developing countries. Okay, and a specific tumor marker is what we discussed with the alpha beta protein. Usually, in most cases, more than about four hundred. And the second case here, we've got a 50-year-old man involved in a road traffic accident. He's a bit more drowsy, lower GCS, he's slightly hypertensive, and he looks pale. When you examine his tummy, uh, he's very tender um, and uh, you know, screaming in a bit of pain as well. Uh, so he is stable enough for you to send him to a CT scanner, um, and he's just come back, and this is what the scan shows. Again, what do we think might be going on? So this particular region here and here and here how would you compare it to this region here do we think it's it's different and what is the term that we would use to describe these tissues so again the, this is more hypo attenuated or hypodense compared to the surrounding tissues. Um, hypodense, yep, good. So uh, this is actually blood and um, essentially a little bit of edema as well, but he, the patients had a liver laceration, that's what's happened, and they are essentially bleeding. So there's a bit of edema and swelling and some blood there as well. So we move on to the next organ, which is the gallbladder. <clears throat> um, now, the anatomy is important. Uh, this is the gallbladder here, by the way. Uh, you've got the fundus, the body, and the neck of the gallbladder, which feeds into the cystic duct, which eventually feeds into the CBD, or it actually joins the hepatic uh, duct to form the CBD. Um, the CBD, uh, you can't sometimes see it very clearly on a CT scan. Uh, but uh, if it's dilated, for example, or if there's signs of infection, which we'll look at soon, uh, then you will be able to see it a little bit better. That's the liver. So the gallbladder sits beneath the liver and the gallbladder fossa. These are your kidneys. This is your pancreas coming through. Uh, this is a bowel, and this is the spleen, essentially. Okay, so that's where we are at the moment. So it should be less than six millimeters at around the age of 60 or less than 60. And then after that, for every decade, you can add on another 
one nanometer essentially. So here's a particular case that um, we can discuss. Uh, this is what a normal gallbladder looks like. This is when it's dilated or essentially it's infected. Uh, and what do we refer a infected gallbladder as? What's the term that we use to describe it? So for example, if you have a female, sudden onset vomiting, right upper quadrant pain, um, infected markers are raised what do you think she has in this particular case? Cholecystitis, yep. So um, what kind of changes would you expect to see around the gallbladder? So it's dilated, the CBD might be dilated, but around the actual organ itself, what would what do you think we might we might see? Um, would the surrounding tissues, yeah, Ed, Edgar and Anjali, thank you. And um, Yep, uh, that's correct, cholecystitis. Uh, what do you think we might be able to see? Uh, will there be some bleeding? Will there be edema? Will there be, uh, what do you think that you, that you might be able to see? So surrounding any organ where there's some kind of infection or most organs, when there's some kind of infection, um, uh, mucosal enhancement, well, thank you. Um, that's good. Uh, so surrounding uh, the gallbladder, there's going to be signs of uh, edema, exactly, impossible obstruction of the cystic duct. Yep, correct. Um, that edema and signs of inflammation or infection essentially present as what we refer to as stranding and stranding is a concept where you see different shades of gray essentially that show edema so you see some darker more hypo intense shades compared to some lighter shades and you'll see that with some other organs in a ct scan as well like kidney we'll come on to that in a minute um so essentially you'll see a thickened gallbladder wall Okay, and you'll see some pericholecystic uh, uh, fat stranding or uh, signs of infection. Right, so the next uh, organ is the spleen, which is here. Okay, uh, so that's the left side of the abdomen and it varies with age and sex, but shouldn't be more than 13 centimeters in the largest diameter, which is going to be basically the diameter where you can measure the largest uh, size, okay? And the one of the best ways to find the spleen is basically to follow the splenic vein and it comes off the inferior vena cava. Uh, so here yeah, is basically the splenic vein. Uh, the pancreas. So um, uh, the best way to uh, find uh, the pancreas is it's going to hug the tail of the uh, splenic vein. So it goes around here. This is actually the head of the pancreas. This is the neck and the tail of the pancreas essentially right here. Um, so uh, in terms of the uh, parts of the pancreas, you've got the dorsal and the ventral part of the, of the pancreas. Now in this particular case, uh, dorsal usually most of the time means a more of a posterior, um, whereas the ventral um, really refers to anterior but in this particular case it's going to be someone of the opposite because embryologically when the when the pancreas is formed um the dorsal bud actually forms most of the head uh and the neck and the tail and the anterior or the ventral part forms one of the inferior parts of the head and the uh, unicate as well uh so that's the pancreas here and that's the head here essentially and these are your kidneys, that's your spleen, that's your liver, this is your gallbladder, we're going into the CBD right there. Uh, so in this particular case, you've got a 40 year old male, he's an alcoholic, four days history, they're all alcoholics, sorry. Um, the four days history of epigastric pain, radiating to the back, he's vomiting. He's ignored his symptoms for a couple of days, come in a bit late. His lipase is significantly increased with infection markers. You're worried for this patient. He's, he doesn't look well. Uh, is this, I mean, it looks abnormal. Um, and what do you think is going on here?
pancreatic cancer, okay, good guess. Um, pancreatitis, okay, cool. So what are the most common causes of pancreatitis? What are the two most common causes? Alcohol and gold stones. Fantastic. Great. So um, alcohol, uh, history of alcohol, think of pancreas, if they're caught complaining of epigastric pain, vomiting, and uh, gold stones, because gold stones, as we said before, we talked about before, you've got the pancreatic duct, which joins the, um, the common uh, bile duct, and that basically comes off. So you've got the hepatic duct, which comes off the liver, you've got the cystic duct, uh, they both join together, and then later on, got the pancreatic duct that joins in, essentially. Um, so uh, if there's any blockage or stone stuck in the CBD, it can cause the, the pancreatic enzymes to flow backwards, and that can cause infection and inflammation, causing pancreatitis or acute pancreatitis, essentially. Uh, alcoholism can also cause it as well, as we discussed. So in this particular case, once again, you can see some hypo dense and massive irregularity compared to the structure that we saw before which looks normal here um, and this is actually forming uh or in the process of forming what's called necrosis so this is basically necrotizing pancreatitis um and it's it's forming a wall it's essentially so it's walled off necrosis but uh this is all massively inflamed and dying tissue of pancreas Right, so moving on further down, uh, we're going to talk about the adrenal glands. So uh, these are them here, essentially, in the retroperitoneum, just above or superior to the kidneys. And they're usually less than about a centimeter thick or so, and they're usually concave. If, they're, if they don't have the same concaveness to them, uh, then sometimes you think there may be cysts or masses of some kind that they're sitting there. Um, or abnormal masses, not cysts, sorry, but abnormal masses that might be causing a change in shape, but usually less one centimeter. Once again, here's a spleen, here are the kidneys, this is the liver, this is the pancreas here. <clears throat> now we're going to talk a little bit about the kidneys. So uh, the kidneys has, uh, we need to understand the system um, of uh, the how, how the kidney functions essentially. You have your renal artery and renal vein, which supply uh, the kidney. Um, now, in terms of the uh, in terms of how the the renal system works, um, essentially, uh, you've got the cortex, and then you've got the medulla. This is all your filtering system. So, from the cortex, blood travels to the medulla, and then uh, from the medulla to the calluses, and that's that's essentially your filtration happening here and from the calluses into the hilum, and from the hilum into the ureter, and that's your urine and uh, excretory products. So um, once again, cortex to the medulla, medulla to uh, your calluses, and then to your hilum, and then to your ureter. So <clears throat> we talked about different stages of contrast before. In the arterial phase, you'd usually see the corticomedullary phase. So it would be around here, basically, the corticomedullary phase. And uh, this phase happens first. So you see that in the first 20 to 40 seconds. Followed by that, you've got the nephrographic phase. Um, so it's just before the delayed phase, essentially, where you can see most of the tissue, uh, the uh, uh, kidney tissue, the parenchymal tissue, essentially. And that's good to highlight any particular parenchymal pathologies, followed by the delayed phase, which is basically where you see the contrast to the ureter and the collecting system. So in cases of, for example, um, a dilated ureter, possibly secondary to a stone or infection of some kind, um, or dilated renal pelvis, uh, you'd be able to see that best in the delayed phase. So here, for example, you can see that this isn't doesn't look like it's a delayed phase. It's probably most likely in the corticomedullary arterial phase. Uh, here, it's pretty much progressing towards delayed because you can see the pelvis is starting to get whiter here or high, higher attenuation. And then once the ureters have a bit of higher attenuation, then it's definitely into the delayed phase. 
So, um, right, so we've got a, a case here, which we probably, you guys probably know, uh, a 60 year old um, who presents with urinary symptoms for five days, didn't take any medication, ignored symptoms, developed fever, vomiting, and some flank pain. And now in the urine, uh, there's some blood and leukocytes. What do we think is going on? Any guesses? Nephritis, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, we refer to this as pyelonephritis. This is a kidney infection, essentially, all right? So you can see here, there's a bit of what I called before as fat stranding. So the tissue around it looks a bit in inflamed and infected, okay? And the kidney looks slightly larger than normal as well. And this is what I mean by the different types of tissue you can see. Yep, pyelonephritis, Edgar. Yep, you're correct. Um, so you've got a bit of higher attenuation and a bit of high uh, hypo attenuation here. And that tells you that there's a bit of edema and swelling around that particular area. So we refer to this as perinephric fat stranding, and that's a sign of an infected kidney or pyelonephritis. Great. So we're going to talk about the uh, the bowel now. So a bit of a recap. Um, so you've got your esophagus, gastroesophageal junction to the stomach, um, which then goes into the small intestine, so your duodenum, jejunum, ileum, uh, which then goes into the cecum through the ileocecal valve. So the ileum goes into the cecum. Uh, cecum and appendix are in the same region, which is the right lower quadrant, ascending colon, transverse, descending colon, sigmoid, rectum, and then anus. Okay, so that's a basic overview of the uh, small intestine, different parts of it. If you don't know the basic anatomy, it can be difficult to orientate where you are. So it's always good to know. And also bear in mind, of course, that your left is their right and vice versa. Okay, the blood supply, we've got uh, slightly higher up at L1, so superior mesenteric, which uh, supplies uh, most of the large intestine, essentially. So two thirds of the transverse colon, the splenic flexure, which is close to the, uh, the spleen on the left side, as we go down, uh, the descending colon, the sigmoid and the rectum. Okay, so it's basically the latter half or the later half of the uh, large intestine. And then you have the inferior mesenteric at L3, and that supplies the small bowel mainly, as well as the transverse colon, and the ascending colon, which goes to the hepatic flexure, okay? So ascending colon, hepatic flexure, transverse colon, and then the splint flexure and descending colon, all right? So this is your stomach full of contrast, essentially, and this is where we can see the gastroesophageal junction around this area region here. Uh, yeah, so as I said, this is full of contrast. Here's your spleen and your liver. Um, oh, one thing I forgot to point out, the stomach, uh, this is referred to as the greater curvature, and this is the lesser curvature, essentially, so just a bit of anatomy to go through. So we're going to look at the uh, small bowel. Uh, so remember that the, the, the bowel can be divided into peritoneal and retroperitoneal, and they have different blood supply as well. Um, so when we look at the duodenum, which is here basically, um, the essentially what happens is is that it it effectively moves across to the right and then back to the left okay um so uh you've got your kidneys here and this is the duodenum and from the duodenum you've got your jejunum and then the ileum and these are some ileal loops that you can see here essentially they're filled with contrast in this particular picture okay um and they go towards the right hand side and when they go towards the right-hand side, the ileum then joins in with the large bowel through the ileocecal valve. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. So here's the ileocecal valve. Um, and one of the signs of the ileocecal valve, sorry, uh, it's meant to be around here. This is the ileocecal valve there. 
is that there's a bit of fat around it. So we call that uh, fat attenuation, and that's how you can find the ileocecal valve, all right? So with the small bowel, remember that it kind of transverses across. Again, goes back into the right lower quadrant, not the left. I think I accidentally said the left before, but it's the right lower quadrant and joins, joins into the uh, cecum in the right lower quadrant. From there, the cecum and appendix, but into the cecum through the ileocecal valve and then the ascending colon. And uh, yep, so that there's ileocecal valves right there. Uh, we're going to talk about trying to find the appendix in just a minute, uh, because when when you look for the appendix, uh, there's different ways people use. But um, a good way is using the ileocecal valve as a checkpoint and progressing from there, essentially. So here we've got uh, the colon. So you've got the ascending colon. And then moving forward, you've got the transverse colon. So just going across here and the descending colon around here. And if we scroll a bit further down, the descending colon will go into the sigmoid and the rectum and the anal canal, which will come down further just around this area, essentially. If you scroll down, you'll be able to see it a little bit more. Um, so I've saved this bit purposely for this particular case. Um, what do we think we're looking at in this particular region? What do you think this is? I kind of mentioned it about three seconds ago, but it's a common case that you'll probably see if you work in a &E or in hospital departments. Yep, appendicitis. So the normal appendix, or finding the normal appendix, um, appendicitis, inflammation, and obstruction, great. So yeah, so absolutely, one of the causes of, a, of an appendicitis could be that they're obstructed. Um, uh, so, uh, and that's using matter, for example, like, you know, uh, uh, fecalits. Um, which can cause an obstruction surrounding inflammation around the appendix. So here's a dilated appendix, essentially. And similarly to other organs, we see some infective changes around the appendix, uh, which suggests that it's inflamed. And the treatment is basically it has to be surgically removed. Uh, so they go for uh, laparoscopic surgery to remove the appendix. But to find the appendix, uh, essentially, if we go back to the ileocecal valve, Usually, if you scroll a little bit more uh, proximally to it, uh, you'll find that the appendix is basically on the same side of the ileocecal valve. Uh, so whenever you're looking for the appendix, uh, it will be in the same region or the same side as the ileocecal valve. So it won't be anywhere up here, but rather down here. Um, and that's important because there's lots of causes for right lower quadrant pain. So when you're looking for the cause for extreme right lower quadrant pain, if you follow that through, you'll be able to see the appendix. Okay. And uh, just recommended resources as we approach the end of the lecture. Uh, if you guys want to learn more, I used a uh, YouTube website uh, to help my uh, supplement my knowledge as well as well as my experience, and that's the Navigating Radiology, um, which has some great lectures by Dr. Rajesh ba uh, Bayana, uh, who's an American doctor. Uh, Radiopedia is a great website, as well as Radiology Cafe, and some basic literature, which is useful. Uh, so uh, who can we see infection after the uh, ruptured appendix? Uh, Edgar, uh, I'm assuming you are asking where we can see the infection. So it would, if the, with the ruptured appendix, it would uh, usually present as massively dilated and also uh, with infective changes uh, around it in this particular region. So yes, you're right. Uh, there will be a lot of infective changes around this particular region and it will be enlarged as well. The usual appendix, uh, it depends on the age, of course, and the body type, but essentially it ranges from about two to eight centimeters. Um, and so we refer to the inflammation around it as periappendicial uh, inflammation. Um, so uh, 
if we see some of that, then we think, yeah, it's it's an infective appendix. But if it's if it's ruptured, it's usually quite quite large. And also, clinical presentation of the uh, patient would give it away as well. Uh, they'd be quite sick uh, and a lot of pain as well, with very infective, uh, high highly infective changes in their bloods to uh, reflect that. Okay. Um, yeah. Any other questions you guys have? I'm happy to go back over any of the slides if you guys want to as well. For appendicitis, would you refer uh, would you prefer ultrasound or CT? Really depends on the uh, presentation. If it's acute, um, in the, in in terms of you know, uh, if the pa if patients in extreme pain. Um, and also uh, their observations are maybe slightly abnormal or their new score, which is a scoring system that we give patients in the United Kingdom is high and you're clinically worried about the patient, then I think consider a CT quite strongly unless there are reasons not to. Um, an ultrasound is more, an ultrasound is great as well to have a look at the appendix, but it's usually, usually better to use an ultrasound if the patient has presented uh, quite stable. Um, so uh, yeah, that would be the difference between the two and when to use them. What if the percentage that the appendix would be of the left lower quadrant? Ah, okay, yeah, good. Uh, I'm glad you asked this question, actually. So uh, that's a variant or abnormal variant, as most people consider it. Um, I'm not sure the exact percentage, Edgar, but what I would say is it, it'd be in the minority of patients. But you're right. Uh, some patients do present with the left side of one. I've read about it in textbooks in medical school as well. Um, there are a couple of tests that you can do on a patient to uh, examine an appendicitis, essentially. Um, and uh, you've got the Robsing's uh, or, uh, test, for example. Um, but having uh, having a feel of the tummy, sometimes if they... I've never actually come across a patient who's come across as an appendicitis with a left lower quadrant pain. Uh, they, all of them are pretty much right lower quadrant. So I'd say, I'd say it's a minority of patients that present with a left lower quadrant pain or left lower quadrant appendicitis yeah and the other test i think it was a psoas psoas sign but yeah any other questions Great. Perfect. I think that's pretty much done. Um, if you guys do come across any, well, have any other questions or any other thoughts, please feel free to let me know. I'm more than happy to answer your questions. Um, you can either contact UIMS or even your emergency medicine society at Pleven and um, or even me personally, I'd bind, whatever. Um, and I'm happy to, to answer your questions to the best of my knowledge. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And thank you, Dr. Hamza, for hosting such an interesting seminar for all of us. It was really great. And uh, for everyone who attended, you all will receive an email in an hour with the feedback forms, if you could fill that. And once you fill it, you will be able to get your certificates. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.